With this morning, turn your Bibles to the book of 2 John. 2 John, this morning, we'll read the first six verses of this book again. We have said this is a very short book, and many of the same themes that were spoken of in 1 John that we just finished a few weeks ago, spoken of here just in a much more concise manner. We for spoke on the first two verses of this book last week. And so, but I wanted to read uh, the, these verses of Scripture for context again today. The elder, to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. Now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, <clears throat> but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Amen. So as we said last week, John speaks as the elder. And as I said, this word can be used in a couple of different ways. Of course, it can certainly have a connotation of one who is older. Uh, when we speak of uh, those that are older than us, very often we'll use the, the term that they're our elders. You've heard the term respect your elders. I heard that term many times when I was growing up here in East Texas, that there was a respect to be had for that. Certainly John was an older man. He lived at least to around age 90, somewhere in that, that uh, time frame. But it could have also uh, had to do with the, the aspect of elders, elders leading the church. Uh, elders, uh, as we see throughout the book of Acts and in the New Testament epistles, <coughs> excuse me, written by the Apostle Paul, we see elders spoken of uh, on numerous occasions as ones who rule the church and who uh, taught uh, the church also. And so really he qualifies on both of those fronts as being the elder. And then when he says the elect lady and her children, we may uh, reference to this, and I believe that given the context of the scripture that the elect lady here that he is speaking of is a particular church group, a church body, and that her children are the members of that body. And so he is addressing the children of this particular church, uh, and I would assume her elder there, her pastor, uh, in this particular letter. And he says, I love you in the truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth. And he says, well, there's a commonness, there's a bond there uh, that we have one with another. If we know the truths uh, concerning Christ, and we know the truths concerning the gospel, which I'm sure they were familiar with, with the, the gospel of John, uh, but those things that had been taught by Christ. And this is what I said, our unity as the people of God is in the truth. Uh, the scripture says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? And so uh, we uh, have a great unity. Our fellowship is in the truth as the people of God. Uh, and there are many, as I said before, many evangelical groups out there uh, in the world today. There are cults out there in the world today that do not preach the truth concerning Christ and salvation and those kind of things. It's, we really can't walk with them in truth. We can't really have a unity or a fellowship with them. Uh, but those that know the truth, he says, I love you in the truth. And not only I myself, but all these that have known the truth, these others uh, that believe the truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation and what he has spoken of, I believe, over in 1 John concerning the Christian life, what the Christian life looks like. And I made reference, I think, last week and many times there are people that have an idea in this day and time about what the Christian life is supposed to look like. But I believe that John very clearly defines 
what the Christian life is supposed to look like and what it is in the book of 1 John. And I believe that also in the Gospel of John. Jesus defines very clearly what Christianity is to look like and what a believer is to be and uh, what defines him. It's not what society defines as a Christian. It is what the Word of God defines as a Christian. That is appropriate. Uh, whether, as I said last week, whether it is on salvation, whether it's on the person of God, the person of Christ, uh, family, uh, what is morality, what is marriage, those things are defined by the Scriptures. That is the truth, whatever we find in the Word of God concerning those things. And so we come down to verse 3 today. And what we find here in verse 3, this grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. This is really a greeting. This is a greeting that John gives. Now, he doesn't do this in 1 John, and he doesn't do it in 3 John, but he does it here. Now, if you look back at Paul's epistles, in every one of his epistles, he gives a very similar type of greeting. Uh, if you look back from the very first epistle that we have, chronologically at least, in the Scriptures, back over at Romans chapter 1 and verse 2, uh, excuse me, not verse 2, but over verse 7, I'm sorry. Verse 7, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he uses the same greeting through all the epistles until you get to 1 Timothy. And then his greeting in 1 Timothy is basically the same here as John's. Grace, mercy, and peace uh, will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is a, a common greeting that is found in these opening, re opening remarks. And you go back through all of these. And, but if you, as I said, if you go back to the pastoral epistles, then beginning in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and there in verse 2, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, a true son of the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, Jesus Christ our Lord. And Paul uses the same greeting in 2 Timothy and in Titus there. Now, some might say, well, that's just a greeting. Let's skip over that. But I don't like, you know, in, in our church, we, uh, we, we preach line upon line, precept upon precept. We need to examine what is said in this greeting. There's nothing in the Scriptures that is not there for our edification. So he says here, grace. Now, I think the reason that this is first in this greeting is to remind the believers as he greets them here, as he gives this greeting, it is to remind them that it is by grace that we have been saved. And that we come into a relationship with God as his children by the grace of God. Now we're all very familiar with the book of Ephesians. And how the grace of God is extolled there in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 1, and there in verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, what? According to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. But it's according to the riches of His grace that we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And so I believe that John, like Paul, wants to remind these believers of that. And of course, we're all very familiar with Ephesians chapter 2. There, uh, beginning in, in verse 7 and in verse 8, he said that in the ages to come, speaking here, believers, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Not just for now, but He said, in the ages to come. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is a reminder there that our salvation is a gift of God. That our redemption, that the forgiveness of our sins is by the grace of God. And again, uh, the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy this time. And here in chapter 1 and verse 9, he writes there. He said, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according what? To His own purpose and grace, which was given to us 
in Christ Jesus before time, before the ages began. So this is to remind these believers that what we are as the children of God is all of grace. I believe it was Charles Spurgeon wrote the, the book, All of Grace. It is all of grace that we are here this morning as the children of God. Secondly, he speaks here of mercy, grace, mercy, and peace. Mercy. I think it is in the mercy of God that we are reminded that the punishment due us has been taken away. Uh, mercy is a, is a doctrine very closely related to the doctrine of propitiation. That is because of the propitiatory sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ that the punishment due us was poured out upon Him and therefore we have mercy because our sins have been propitiated by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you remember the, the tale or the story that, that is told in the New Testament of how that the Pharisee uh, when he prayed, uh, spoke of, Oh, Lord, I'm, or God, I'm glad that I'm not as this publican over here, but I fast twice a week, I give tithes, I, I go to the synagogue, I'm glad I'm not like him. But the publican would not even lift his eyes up toward heaven and cried out, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He recognized the need for the mercy of God, but in that is implied there that idea of propitiation. And so I believe that there is a sense in, the, in this that John is implying and reminding them of the propitiatory sacrifice and the shedding of the blood of Christ that we might have mercy as the children of God. And this is a doctrine found uh, both in uh, Paul's writings and John's writings and in Peter's writings. In Ephesians chapter 2, and there in verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes, But God, who is what? Rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us. We are reminded of the love of God through the mercy of Christ that has been poured out upon us and given to us. It is also in Romans chapter 9 that we are reminded about God and His mercy. In chapter 15, and verse 16, it says, For He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion, so that it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Then in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, the Apostle Peter reminds us there, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that has been given to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 3, he reminds us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. There again, magnifying the mercy of God, I believe, that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ and His propitiatory sacrifice. And then thirdly, of course, John speaks of peace here. Peace. And there's a reminder here that God, because God has exercised grace and exercised mercy, that we now have peace with God. Before grace was exercised upon us, before we received the mercy of God, all of those outside of Christ, the Scripture says, are at enmity with God. There is no peace with God apart from the grace of God and His salvation and the mercy of God. We cannot just declare a truce because our sinful nature and the fact that we are sinners puts us at enmity against God because He is a holy God. It is in the book of Romans that the Apostle Paul writes of this in chapter 5 and there in verse 1. 
The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're reminded, I think it is back over in Romans chapter 3, that God, even in the time when we were still His enemies, He died for us. Christ died for us. We were at enmity against God. In chapter 10 of Romans, and there in verse 15, we're reminded, How shall they preach unless they are sinned? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach what? The gospel of peace. Who bring glad tidings of good things. If you would have peace with God, you must hear it in the gospel of peace. It is a gospel of peace. It is a gospel of reconciliation. That this is how that man is reconciled with God. This is how that you have peace in your soul. is through the Lord Jesus Christ. By believing the gospel. Yeah. Believing the gospel. It is the power of God. The salvation. This gospel is a gospel of peace. Yeah. It brings peace to the souls of men. Again, in Ephesians chapter 2. Yeah. And this time in verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul writes that, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, those of you that you once were enemies, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace. He is our peace. We are in Him. We are at peace with God. If we are not in Him, if we have not been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not at peace with God. There is no peace in the soul of a man outside of Christ, outside of being. So these blessings of grace and mercy and peace to the children of God come from both God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I think something else that we see in this greeting here that I think is a deliberate thing by Paul and by John here is to emphasize that there is equality between the Father and the Son. They are both God. They are both deity. You see, that was part of the controversy of that day that Christ didn't really come in the flesh. That He just came as a spirit in the Gnostic heresy. And that somehow, you know, He just appeared as a man. He didn't really come as a real man. So, John went to great lengths. If you read, uh, if you read the Gospel of John, if you look in 1 John and the 2nd and 3rd, as we shall see, there's great emphasis there in the writing of John upon the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he and the Father are one. Not just one in purpose, but one in essence. Right. They are both deity. This was a vital point of Christian doctrine in the early church. As we have already studied here in 1 John. But if you look at that, if you look at that Acts chapter 2, where Peter preached that great sermon on the day of Pentecost, when there was the Pouring out of the Holy Spirit. You go through that. What? I mean, over and over and over again, Peter is speaking of Christ and emphasizing the, the Lordship of Christ there, the deity of Christ. And you get down here to the end of it, down in the verse uh, 36, Peter says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus, Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jesus told told the disciples to see me is to see the Father. And this is something that needs to be reemphasized in this day and time. The 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 point of contention between true, true Christianity and cults is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you identify a cult? or a false religion, or a false teaching. They don't believe this truth about the deity, the eternal sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that He came in the flesh to die for the sins of His people. 
I mean, that is a crystal clear test uh, that you can give. You have very often, I've had some discussions about uh, with some people at work and some people here about different ones that come up and they come to their door and they want to start uh, <coughs> talking uh, to them about, about, you know, about their religion, about their belief system. I had a conversation uh, with my niece, Crystal, about uh, she's had some Jehovah's Witnesses that have come up to her door and she's had conversations with them. And she says, I will tell you straight up front, you know, I don't agree with what you teach. There is a great chasm between what they believe about Jesus Christ and salvation and what we as Christians believe about Him. And there are others. They're not the only ones. But there is a real difference. And if you look here, if you go back to 1 John and what we looked at there, John right straight, as we would say, out of the gate there in the beginning of this book, speak, starts speaking about Christ. He says that that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested. We have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and then was manifested to us that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. See, to believe in the Father, if you're going to say you're going to believe in the Father, you must believe in His Son, Jesus Christ also. There is not one without the other. You go to chapter 2. Verses 22 through 24 of 1 John. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. See, if you deny that Jesus is the Christ, you're denying the Father also. Whoever denies the Father, I mean, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. So if you would have the Father, you would have eternal life. If you would be right with God the Father, then you must believe in the Son also. And then he speaks here, he uses this term, this term here, the Son of the Father. The Greek word that is used here for Son is a term called, is a term weos. Now this is the only phrase that is used in relationship between Jesus and the Father. He's never called, like we're called children of God, He's never called the child of God the Father. Mm -hmm. It's a different word. Mm -hmm. It's techno or technos. Mm -hmm. It's a term that is used for Christ. Jesus is never called a child of God. And very often the term is we are stay, <coughs> son of God. Yes. And it signifies this term here, the, the term for techno indicates a birth. Well, Jesus was birthed into this world. He came in the flesh, but he was already God. Yeah. God here. He was already we are stay, yeah. son of God. And so it already signified the relationship of offspring to the parent, not simply the birth. There was already that eternal relationship with the Father. He didn't somehow attain to it or earn it. And so that's what John is, is referencing here. I remember I, I thought about in, uh, in the Gospel where uh, Jesus, you remember, got separated from His earthly parents, Joseph and Mary, and they got a day or two down the road and discovered he wasn't with them, and they went back to the temple and found him there with the teachers of Israel, and they kind of scolded him for it, and he said, don't you know that I must be about my father's business, the father in heaven. And then he says here that it is in truth and love, in truth and love. Note here that the truth of God and the love of God are linked together here. To know God the Father 
And the Son in truth is to love the Father and the Son. You cannot truly love God the Father and truly love the Lord Jesus Christ without knowing experientially the truth that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He is coming to the world as the Father's only way of salvation. In John chapter 1, in verse 14, John writes, And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In John 3, Beginning with verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him, who is the truth, should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If you're going to truly love God, you must believe and commit yourself and put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the truth, who is the true way of salvation. As He said in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. So, truth and love are inseparably linked together. Then we come to verse 4. John continues here in his teaching, I rejoice greatly that I have found of thy children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. John had a great rejoicing in his heart, that these children, these spiritual children, we referenced how very often in 1 John he spoke of them as his children. He was very close to them. But these children whom he loved so greatly were being obedient to his admonitions. And the truth of the gospel and the word of God. And the Apostle Paul expressed a similar type of joy or rejoicing in those that he had had the oversight of, that he had taught, that he had preached to in these many of these churches that he had helped establish. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20, Paul said, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ is coming? For you are our glory and joy. Let me say this. Those that preach and teach God's Word and pastor, have the oversight of God's flocks, what they ought to find their joy and rejoicing in more than anything else is their flocks. And as John did here, that they are obedient. That they are obedient to the Word of God. I mean, there's a love, I believe, that that God puts within the hearts of His true pastors for their flock. I mean, I love other people outside of Faith Baptist Church. I have other believers that I have a relationship that I love, other churches that I know of, but I don't have the same love, I guess you would say it is, for them that I do for you. There is a love, there is a joy that comes for the minister of God, the teacher of God's Word, as he ministers to the flock of God, as he is there for hopefully a number of years and years and years, as in my case. I don't know that that's, that's kind of the exception rather than the rule nowadays, but I've been here over 22 years, that as I have taught the Word of God, to see members of the body walking in truth. Being obedient to the Word of God. Growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
You see, back over there in Ephesians 4 where Brother Wayne has been teaching us in Sunday school talks there about pastor teachers being given to the church. Uh, basically, to teach the truth so that you wouldn't be children anymore tossed to and fro about with every wind of doctrine. I believe this, that it is the job of a faithful pastor to teach and preach the truth of God's Word so that you might walk in truth. That's right. And that you might grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and that you might be more and more conformed to the Word of God through the work of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Yeah. Yeah. Have we not as... Paul talked about, back over there in Romans 8, 28 through 30, he talks there about the, the, the golden chain of grace and the work of God, the sovereignty of God and salvation, but we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, and is that not work, not to begin in this life? I believe that. You ought to be more Christ-like now, much more than the day that you were saved, if you've been saved for any time. Yes. And we all go through periods of time, maybe when we stray away from God or backslide away. For you know, this song says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And we do that sometimes, but thankfully for God's chastening and chastising hand, because He loves us, He brings us back to the Word of God and to the church of God. And hopefully to a faithful pastor of God who will speak the truth in love and point them to the, to the path of obedience. Let me say this. The path of disobedience is not the path of the believer. Yeah. It is not. The pastor is like a shepherd, as he's been talked about in the Scriptures, who takes his rod and he watches over the flock, but sometimes sheep, as we know, are rebellious creatures and dumb creatures. I'm not making reference to anybody here. But sometimes we stray and we need the rod. We need the stick. We need to be knocked in the head, spiritually speaking. Knocked over the noggin. I have needed it in my life. And I'm thankful for those times that I have been that steered me back to the path of righteousness and brought me back inside the sheepfold to obedience to where I needed to be with fellowship with the people of God. Let me tell you something, believer. It's lonely out there outside the fold. Mm -hmm. And my belief is that if you're a sheep, you won't stay out there real long. Mm -hmm. That he'll bring you back and he'll bring you back to a flock. But he finds the pastor like John finds his satisfaction and joy in obedient children. It's a grieving thing. You know, I think about Paul and that, and that letter that he had to write to the Corinthian church. They were a disobedient church. Now he called them saints. Boy, you look about that, look at that, and see all those problems and the sin problems in that place. You think, man, okay, you know better than I, Lord, and you call them saints, so they're saints. But, but that chastising letter, I'm sure, was difficult for Paul to write. It was difficult for him to say those things in that. And in Philippians chapter 1, we have a little different take of Paul's uh, letter to on the Philippians, how he saw them. He said in verse chapter 1, verse 3 of Philippians, he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Maybe he had just written in the Corinthians, I don't know. He was like, man, I'm glad for that Philippian church. Woo! I thank God for them. In chapter 2, he said, there, we get first two verses. He said, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Amen. See, that's where his joy came from, that there was a peace and a unity and obedience 
in the church to the things of God, to the Christian life. And so he goes on to say here in this, that I have found of your children. Now, some versions may say some, but that's italicized. That's not in the original, original manuscripts. That I have found of your children walking in truth. His rejoicing is that these children are walking in truth. There is a connection between knowing the truth and walking in the truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. If you know the truth, if you know Christ experientially, I believe you will walk in the truth. Yeah. You will walk in the truth. It is not simply enough to have a head knowledge of Christ and the doctrine of God's Word. That there is to be, there is an acknowledgement here of what John says that children that know Christ, children of God, walk in truth. There are those who believe that you can simply somehow have this mental acknowledgement of Christ and follow a formula and then never be obedient to the Word of God and never really follow Him in truth. And somehow you can still say, but I'm going to be in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that that differs with what God's Word says. And that's where I want to go to point that out. In John 15, the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here, about His teaching about I am the vine and my Father is the vine dresser. There's much I could go down through here and say, but let me go to this. In chapter 15 and verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. In verse 14, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. If I call Jesus your friend, then you do whatever He commands you. Then again, in Romans chapter 6, when when. Paul was teaching about the law and, and now the grace of God that we are saved by grace. You go back up to verse 20 of chapter 5. He says, The law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Mm -hmm. You go down to verse 1, he anticipates the question, saying, Well, if, if, if it's better that, that, you know, that, that, uh, I might offend so that more grace might abound. What does he say there? I, I, I should be able to sin more. No, he says, what should we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It says certainly not in my version. It really means God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And you go down to verse 4. Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Yeah. <clears throat> See, this is what Paul says. If you're going to say that you've been saved by the grace of God, then you're going to walk in that grace. And you're going to walk in obedience to those things. Verse chapter 8 of Romans 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And what you find over and over again in the New Testament is this talk about a walk. And may I say this in the original language? This means a continuous walk. That's what it means. It's in the present participle. You're walking and you keep on walking. It is an upward, it is a straight walk. It is a pleasing walk. Pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. Going back again to Ephesians chapter 2. In this time, of course, 
Some other verses we haven't read so far, but, but Paul talks about in verse 2 about the walk of these believers before they were saved. He said, in which you all, you once walked according to the course of this world. How do we walk before salvation? We walk according to the course of the world. The desires of the world, the passions of the world. But then you go down to verse 10. What does he say about the difference in our walk and our works now? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand. What? That we should walk in them. Amen. Yes. God ordained it. He ordained that we are going to walk in a certain path. It's going to be in a path pleasing to him going to be in a path, I believe, of holiness. Not perfect holiness. We all understand that. But it is going to be, I think, in a consistent path to do those things that are pleasing to God. But it's not only the Apostle Paul, but Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verses 13 through 16. It says, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust in your ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Amen. I believe that it is very plain that those called by God, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ, are going to be obedient. They're going to walk in truth. They're going to be not satisfied with walking in what is not true and following that which is not truthful and that which is not please God. You may do it as I've said for a little while, but... God, I believe, in His providence will bring us back to the path of righteousness. You look back over at 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. He wrote there, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. The evidence is that if we're walking in the light, we've been cleansed from our guilt by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in chapter 2, in verse 6, He who says He abides in Him ought Himself also to walk just as He walked. And what is that walk? It is walking in truth. It is walking in sincerity. It is walking in holiness and righteousness, forsaking and not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind as a child of God. And he says this to give emphasis to them as we receive commandment from the Father. John. Yes. This is not John's commandment. Secondarily it is, I guess. But primarily this is the Father's commandment. This is, thus saith the Lord, this is what you are to be doing. This is how you are to be following me. This is how you are to be walking. You are to be walking in my truth. You are to be walking in the truth of God, in obedience to the Word of God, in righteousness and in holiness. Not in rebellion, but walking with Him. And walking the path that He has with Him. Again, Lord, we thank you for the clarity of your word. We thank you, Father, for the truth of your word. We thank you for Christ this morning who laid down his life for ransom for many, who shed his blood for our sins. Heavenly Father, I pray that as the Word of God has been preached this morning, that we, each one, would submit ourselves to what you command. 
what you require, what you say. Father, continue to help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ until we go home to be with you. May each and every day we be more conformed to the image of Christ. May we be less conformed to the world and be more transformed in the renewing of our mind to Jesus Christ and what he desires. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.